Sometimes, on days like this, being a pilot must be one of the best jobs in the world. Today, on this beautiful morning in the Adriatic, we have arrived in Šibenik, a coastal city in Croatia, around 280 kilometers up the coast from Dubrovnik, and surrounded by craggy islands with mystical ancient names. Actually, we're not visiting the city, but taking a coach around yet more hairpin bends, considerably less dangerous than those in Kotor, to Kruka National Park, a few miles inland along the Kruka River. This park is 109 square kilometers of gorgeous wooded mountainous scenery with 17 natural waterfalls at its heart that undulate over its unique naturally formed travertine dams and pools. The centre of the park focuses on these stunning cascades and there's mile upon mile of raised walkway for you to meander between the rushing water, tumbling over the travertine geomorphic forms that vary in height and steepness. The sound of the water is loud in places but it's a marvellous soundtrack to a stunning location in one of those natural areas with multiple viewpoints that cry out for a selfie or two. There's so much more to the Kruka National Park than we had time for, unfortunately, and we were soon heading for one of Croatia's oldest towns, Skradin. It's a pretty little photogenic place sitting on the Kruka River at the entrance to the National Park, full of cobble streets, archways and steep steps, up impossibly narrow passages, with a documented history going back to 33 BC. Luckily for the 21st century tourist, the marina has been modernised since then and it's an ideal spot for afternoon refreshments and a few boat-inspired pictures. Microsoft founder and all-round billionaire good guy Bill Gates even named it as his favourite vacation place in Forbes magazine. <laughs> I'm guessing he likes to stay in a large villa with plenty of windows and when the outlook is excellent. Once back on the ship, we were lucky not to get entangled with the preparations for Azamara's signature white night evening, which happens every cruise, and if the weather is on your side, takes place around the beautiful pool area and grill. And we all love an outdoor deck party, don't we? On white night, guests are encouraged, but it's not mandatory, to wear something white. Or everything white. Hence the name White Night. White Night is an absolute delight. The food, drink and jovial spirit is free-flowing and Azamara really pushed the boat out. I promise that's the last pun. In making this a real highlight of the cruise. live music from the brilliant lounge band and an energetic sing and dance along with the ship's singers. There's a massive feast prepared and served al fresco, yet more dancing, random congas and premium liquor shots. Chargeable, but hey, it's a celebration, so go for it. Overall, it's one of the very best parties you'll experience at sea, and virtually everyone joins in and wears white, which is a great original touch and puts everyone in a party mood.
and although the headache from the night before did its best to keep us in bed, due to an iron resolve and a GoPro that needed setting up for a time lapse, it failed. Venice was far too important, particularly now they've decided to banish cruise ships from the Gendeca Canal, and therefore, coming anywhere near its historic centre following a crash between an ocean ship and a river ship earlier that month. The MSC Opera and the River Countess were still there under investigation when we arrived. In fact, the River Countess was taped off, like a crime scene, at the very berth we were supposed to dock at, right near the centre of the city. So we actually had to settle for a much less romantic berth in the more industrial cruise port out of the city. Which was a shame, as we were overnighting and walking into the centre in the summer's dusky light would have been just perfect. Never mind though, for we were not going to conventional Venice today, we were going to do something a little bit different, and a little bit further afield, north in fact, to the islands of Murano and Burano. Murano, famous worldwide for its decorative glass making, lies just under a mile north of the main city, and is reachable by water taxi. In 1291, the government of Venice, fearing widespread fires destroying much of the wooden city, banned furnaces from central Venice moving them to Murano, and for centuries, Murano had the monopoly for top quality glass making. To this day, the glasswork here is still sought after the world over, and can be seen in the best restaurants, hotels, and ultra luxury establishments across the globe. We had the opportunity to visit a glass making factory and see a master at work. He made it look so easy, although it probably takes years to form asbestos hands, and such a steady eye. Disappointingly, we weren't allowed to film or take pictures in this company's main glass showroom, but the pieces on display were incredible and the showroom was huge. It's just a shame we can't show you. Here's a few on display outside, which only scratches the surface of what we saw within. You'll have to go. Another three miles further north into the lagoon, we stopped at Burano, and after wondering whether any other island's name ended in Burano, we headed into the centre of this stunning little clutch of five neatly packed together islands. Burano really has to be seen with your own eyes, dear viewer. Its brightly painted houses and mini canals are like something from a children's film set. Venice simplified and in miniature. The colours of the houses follow a specific system, originating from the golden age of its development. If someone wishes to paint their home, they must send a request to the government, who will respond by making notice of a certain colour permitted for that particular building. Burano is not just famous for its colourful homes and the precariously leaning campanile, or bell tower, of St Martini Church it's actually more famous for its lace. We visited a traditional lace maker in the middle of the islands and we really didn't realise that the real Burano lace made by hand using centuries old methods is incredibly lengthy process. So renowned was this lace that in 1481 Leonardo da Vinci visited and purchased some for Milan Cathedral, the largest church in Italy and the fifth largest church in the whole world. Burano is an absolute jewel in the Venetian lagoon and you simply must visit if your cruise stops, starts or finishes here. It's well worth the taxi ride, which takes 45 minutes to an hour. Well, sadly, Venice is where we have to call this series to an end. We really hoped you've enjoyed our voyage from Civitavecchia all the way around Italy and up the Adriatic and we thank Azamara wholeheartedly for sponsoring this trip, keeping us well fed in their fabulous restaurants 
and ever so slightly dizzy with their inclusive drinks package. Thank you so much for watching and please subscribe.